Thanks for tuning in to the IGM podcast. We're so glad you've decided to explore God's word with us. We look forward to connecting with you in email at info at or online at our website, www.integritygm.com. We hope this podcast encourages you to grow in the knowledge of God through his word. Be blessed. Blessings to everyone today in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah. Today we're going to continue in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. And I'm going to preface before we start reading some comments about this section. In this section, Paul is laying the foundation of the gospel. Verses 1 through 17 is an introduction, his desire to impart a spiritual gift among them, and to let them know he's not ashamed of the gospel. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. And he quotes from Habakkuk or Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. But the righteous man shall live by faith. So Paul is not ashamed of the gospel, and he's willing to lay down his life for the gospel because he's going to be going to Rome. It's a very troubling time for a believer in Christ, a believer in the Messiah, Whether you are Jew or Gentile, if you named the name of Jesus Christ, then that was a problem for you. And in Rome, the community of faith in Rome was at the center of it, of the persecution, of the hatred, of the troubles that were building. And so he's not ashamed of the gospel. He's excited about coming to them and parting some type of spiritual gift among them, having ministry among them, and he's not ashamed of the gospel. So what is the gospel? That's going to start in verse 18. And I'm going to preface everything that we're going to study today with this understanding. The gospel starts with the understanding that we are separated from God because of our sin. Sin separates us from God. I encourage you to go and read Isaiah chapter 59 and understand that chapter that he makes very clear, God, through Isaiah to the Jewish people, it is your sin that separates you from your God. And so today, as we're in a Western culture that is looking at church growth, not so much building the kingdom, church growth, and how to build a big community of faith, it's more about getting people into the church, growing them, not judging them, not dealing with issues of sin until later on. And we must understand, for Jesus, it was at the forefront. For Paul, in laying the foundation of the gospel, it was the first thing that he starts with. Your sin separates you from God. Man walked away from God, and that's the foundation of the gospel. So what brings us to the gospel is a recognition within our own lives that we have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God, and there needs to be repentance that brings us to faith in Christ by God's grace. And when we eliminate that first part, you may grow a big church, but you're not necessarily building the kingdom. And in the process, as you're allowing sin to live inside the community of faith and not dealing with it on the front end and people not coming into the kingdom by repentance and putting their faith in Christ, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole batch. And that's 1 Corinthians 5. I encourage you to go back and listen to that chapter. And so I'm saying all of this as we're going through verses 18 through 32. This is the foundation of how mankind walked away from God, how mankind refused to acknowledge God, refused to give thanks to God, and how God gave them over three times in verses 24, 26, and 28, how he released them to do what they wanted to do. And please know, we do have a free will. God in his sovereignty gave us a free will. And without free will, really, the Bible falls apart. We're not robots. God gave us a choice. Choose this day whom you're going to serve, Joshua says. And so we have a choice. We have a free will. This is a covenant relationship that God has come to us through the old covenant, through the prophets, through the Abrahamic covenant, through the law. And now in these last days, he has come to us through eternal salvation through his Son, in which now we can stand complete and holy before God. The foundation of it is 
man has walked away from God, and man is responsible for his rebellion against God. We do have a free will, and we're going to look at these verses here and see what is the foundation of the gospel, starting in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So the wrath of God is revealed against sinful man who live in unrighteousness, who live in ungodliness, and it is coming from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness who suppress the truth. The truth is that God is holy, and God is a God that expects us and desires of us a relationship with him, but cannot we cannot have a relationship with him if we're living in sin and living in rebellion to who he is, and therefore men suppress the truth in their unrighteousness, by their lives, and the wrath of God is against mankind. You may be wondering, what does it mean to suppress the truth? Well, I think Paul is going to lay it out to us as we read the following verses. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, or it can be translated among them, for God made it evident to them. What is this that is evident among them or within them? Let's read the next verse. For or because, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they, who is they? Mankind, are without excuse. So what is it that speaks of the existence of God? What is it that speaks of Him existing and His eternal attributes? Yes, kind of like that Paul brings this up, because you hear the argument a lot of times, so people that don't know God or they, they have no idea who God is, how could they be justly punished for something, having no clue about it. But you can see here Paul's argument is that all of creation shows that there is a God, that God is real, that there is a creator, that we're his creation without excuse to, to do that and to know, to say we didn't know any better because God has shown us throughout entire creation when he created the world. And think about this. Paul is talking about from the very beginning. The very beginning, the existence of God, of the relationship between the creator and the creation, that it speaks of his existence. And we're going to read some more. Look at the first part of verse 21, for even though they knew God. So this is why I'm saying this corporate responsibility for actions and for sin. And I've explained it before, and I'll explain it again. If I do not acknowledge God, give thanks to God then that destroys me because I'm living a lie and not living in the truth that does not just affect my life, but it affects my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, and so forth. And so this is looking back at mankind from the beginning, humanity, how it walked away from God. Even though they knew God, they knew of his existence, they refused to acknowledge him and give thanks unto him. And so let's read verse 21, and, and let me just say, creation speaks of his existence. A professor once said this, as students were coming into the class, he says, I can prove that there is no God. And they said, how? He says, because I cannot see God, I cannot hear God, I cannot smell God, I cannot touch God, and I cannot taste God. And the students did not know how to respond, but one student said, Professor, if that is true, you do not have a brain. And he says, what do you mean? He says, I cannot see your brain, I cannot hear your brain, I cannot smell your brain, I cannot taste your brain, and I cannot touch your brain. He says, yes, I understand that right now, those things you cannot observe in my life with the senses, but you can see the evidence of my brain by the things that I'm doing. The student said, that is exactly how it is with God. Look at the universe. Look at everything within creation. It speaks and screams of the existence of God. Even though you cannot touch him, you look at creation. It speaks about a creator. 
And so from the very beginning, creation knew the creator. And I'm talking about special creation, us, mankind, that were created in God's image, that there was this understanding of God and that God created all things. But look at verse 21. For even though they knew God, humanity, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. How does it start? By refusing to acknowledge God. What comes next? If you don't acknowledge God, you do not give thanks unto God. He's the creator. And then what happens within your life? You become futile in your own speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Their heart becomes dark with the things of this world and sinful nature. And there's a process, and you see this all the way through Scripture, a process that starts with refusing to acknowledge God. And what it takes us to is darkness. Scott, I know you don't like it when I bring up your dad because it always makes you cry. But I do remember you telling me how your dad every Thursday would go on visitation to people in the hospital and people that were shut-ins in their homes, and you would get to go with them in the summer, and that different people had such different attitudes, and some were very angry and grumpy about their situation, and you said some that were even more sick than the last person you saw were so grateful and thankful, and it really does show us that no matter our circumstances, God is holy, God is creator, God is the great I am, And if we have a thankful heart, it actually not only leads us away from darkness, but it leads us to really having a beautiful life in God. Yes, I think you're referring to one time seeing two different ladies that were in the church. One was so angry at God, and her situation was very minor compared to the next lady. And her countenance and everything was just visibly so different than the next lady who was close to death. And in that situation, seeing how this second lady was so thankful, so grateful, such a relationship between her and God, and the acknowledgement of God was in everything in her life, and you could see it. That's how we need to be, acknowledging God, giving thanks to to God, putting our life into God's hands, knowing that He is the Creator and we are God's special creation. We were made in the image of God to have a relationship with Him, and that relationship is so powerful. And in this new covenant that we're going to be looking at, it is complete, eternal salvation, everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so, yes, just the opposite is taking place within humanity from what I experienced with that second lady who had such praise unto God, even in a difficult situation. Verse 22 defines Western culture today. I would say it defines all culture around the world that refuses to acknowledge the one true God. Professing to be wise, they become fools. Think about the culture that we're living in in America, Western culture. Not talking as much about Eastern culture, but it's there as well. We think that we're so educated and we're so proud and we don't acknowledge God. And think about the foolishness that is coming out today, saying that a person can choose their own gender, a person can self-identify, a person can do whatever they want to within their lives. As long as you're not harming someone else, it's okay. A man can get up on a stage and address with full makeup and wig and everything and is changing his gender. And people are standing up and clapping it with a standing ovation. And they think they're intelligent. They think they're progressive. They think that they've come to a point that they know what's best. And you, if you look at that environment, they're not acknowledging God. And professing to be wise, you almost have to laugh at them. Professing to be wise, they become fools. They can't even acknowledge basic science in their curriculum. They change the science, and you look at that, how incredible professing to be wise, this world that doesn't acknowledge God, 
has become fools. And I think there's always been wacky people out there that say weird stuff like that. But the thing that's really foolish about it now is that they're saying you have to accept this as being science. You have to accept this because some other person thinks something that's totally out of the realm of possibility. You know, 10 years ago, you would not you would have never had a conversation about that. And what I see Paul kind of doing here is he breaks this kind of progression down, right? You know, if we're talking about creation, creator, you know, we have this sinful nature of the fall of man. Satan was prideful. That's why he fell, because of pride. So when we're not giving thanks to God, and literally there's a lot of beautiful songs written, he's the air we breathe. He's the only reason we're doing a podcast, taking a breath, because we have air that he created. So how can you not just give him thanks for your breath when you wake up in the morning, just every day? everything. And when you start, and you you see Paul progressing, when you start not thanking him and thinking you're better, and it's you and it's me, and this self sort of worship, then, yeah, you go to this foolishness. You progress yes. and progress until you're not even acknowledging yeah. him when you wouldn't even be here if yes. he didn't create you. You start, you start self-identifying. I'm actually 17, 6 foot 4, 220 pounds, and I'm never going to grow old. You know, once you start doing that, professing to be wise, you become fools. And we uh, are not living in reality. And I agree with you fully acknowledging God, giving thanks to God, keeping our hearts right with God, pure before God, coming to God through this eternal salvation. Wow, what a beautiful life it is. I don't have to go any other direction except to God. And praise God that we have that reality. We're not living in a world that's not in touch with reality. God is our reality. Verse 23 They profess to be wise, verse 22, professing to be wise, they become fools, and exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So instead of the focus being upon the creator, the focus is going to be upon the creation. And we're going to see, starting in the next verse, of how God's going to give them over. I remember living overseas at one point and seeing a man in a park, and he was worshiping the sun. And the first thing that came to my mind was that if I drew an incredible sun on a piece of paper, if I was a great artist, no one would go to the piece of paper and say, you are amazing, to the sun. They would come to the artist. And they would give acknowledgement and praise to the artist. That makes me think of this verse because I saw people worshiping all kinds of things living overseas. And it just broke my heart because it was so misdirected. Yes, I never thought of it in that way, but it's such an incredible point. And this is what is happening with mankind here. Instead of the creator, they started worshiping the creation. Verse 24, therefore... God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. Think about the responsibility. It was the lust of their hearts that God is giving them over to. God is releasing them to the lust of their own hearts, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. What does that exactly mean? We don't know fully, but we're going to see some things later on that it could be speaking about. Verse 25, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So in verse 23, you get this overall understanding, professing to be wise, they become fools, and the focus is not on the Creator, but on the creation, and worship of the creation. Verse 24, God gives them over. God releases them. In the lust of their hearts to impurity. There's lust in their hearts. And what does that lead to of releasing them to worship the creation? And so the first time in which God is releasing the human race, we see the worship of the creation. And if we go back in all of human history, this is our history of mankind, moving away from the creator to the creation, worshiping the moon, the stars, the sun, the animals, and anything that we can create, that we can see and visualize and touch with our own hands, and that becomes the object of our worship. Verse 26, 
For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their errors. We're living in society that doesn't want to talk about this. The second time that God is releasing mankind to the lust of their hearts to impurity is leading to homosexuality being accepted and normal within society. Men burning in passion for men, women burning in passion for women. This is not natural. This is unnatural. This is not how we were created. We were created to have relationship between a man and a woman. This is how God created us and ordained us, and this is how a family comes together. Yet, as God released them to do what they wanted to do in the lust of their own hearts, it also led to unnatural relationships within the human race. This is something that people don't want to talk about. Even in the church growth model that we see today, don't speak about this, don't speak about that, just love people, bring them in. But Paul, from the beginning, is speaking about sin. Because how can we come to repentance that embraces faith in Christ if we're not speaking about sin? How can we have people sitting in our churches comfortable and their lives not being challenged by the Word of God by speaking about sin and what is right and what is wrong? How can they be comfortable in that setting? How will they ever come to a true repentance that puts their faith in Christ? So again, it's not about church growth. It's about the kingdom. And remember, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's all about repentance of the sinful nature that gets a hold of mankind as God has released us in the lust of our own hearts to break that and to put our faith in Christ. So the second time that God released mankind, immorality in a way that we never thought would be possible, going from the natural to the unnatural and believing that this is okay. Going back to, to verse 24, you know, at the end of it, it says their bodies would be dishonored among them. Do you think this giving up the natural affection, because, you know, I know you don't like to cross-reference a lot, but Paul talks about fornication being, you know, the one thing that does dishonor your body directly. Is that a safe way to see the way he wrote that? Because I was always wondering what that meant, their bodies would be dishonored among them. Well, if you go down to verse 27, because we're not jumping from one context to a, another, we're staying in the same context. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons or in themselves the due penalty of their error. The way that I would read this, it's a sin against our own nature. It's a sin against our own persons. When we're taking the natural and now going with the unnatural. So I do believe that in verse 24, it does have the understanding flowing into verse 27 that their bodies would be dishonored among them. They're sinning against themselves. They're sinning against the very way in which God has made us. Also about verse 27, when it says, in themselves the due penalty, I wonder if it's the things that come upon the body as a result of that kind of sin, because there's diseases, because of the unnatural placement. There's also the very sad aspect of your relationship has no chance for reproduction. And having children, I've never seen God's creation so closely and intimately. And so you really lose that. That is a penalty to me. Yes, I think a lot of people saw this to interpret this as things that come out of unnatural relationships. I'm not so sure that we can say that. There is a possibility of that, but they're sinning against themselves. And the way that I would understand that, the way that God made us. We're sinning against that, receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And I think the greatest consequence of homosexuality is what you're saying. Secondly, we're sinning against the way that God created us, 
And now the natural functions of having a family, a husband and a wife and children, they are sinning against their own selves. I hope everybody understands what I'm saying here. When we're in Western cultures that believes that everybody has individual rights, what the community that is promoting, what are the initials, LBGT and so forth, it goes on and on. What they're asking for is not the same rights as everyone else, but they're asking for special rights that nobody else has that natural laws will not give to them. A man and a man cannot produce a family. So they're saying to others, you have to give us the right that we can become husband and husband, which is not allowed by nature to produce a family, and now legally they can go and adopt children. So they're asking for special rights. When we look at this, I also want to say that I don't believe anybody is born a homosexual. I believe that we are born with a sinful nature. I do not believe someone is born a kleptomaniac. I don't believe someone is born a pedophile. I don't believe that someone is born a murderer, but we are born with a sinful nature. And as we're coming through this sinful world, we are being shaped and discipled in the ways of the world from a very early age. Even in sexuality, we're being shaped at a very early age. With this sinful nature coming into a sinful world, we are developing tendencies towards different things that will destroy our lives. And here, this is taking place. But now, as we go through the rest of these verses, we're saying that these things are okay, that they're healthy, that they're good, and they should be promoted within society. The gospel is saying just the opposite, that they will receive in themselves the due penalty of their error. They're sinning against themselves. And homosexuality is not just sin against God, but it's sin against themselves and how God has made us naturally. And we have to remember that. And the church has to be very strong in speaking out against all sin And all sin separates us from God. And homosexuality that is wanting to be presented as not a choice, but something that we're born with, we have to stand up against that lie to recognize it and to call it as sin and to see these people set free by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's always interesting to me how people are justifying some of these things that are so plain and so clear. And when you do a math problem, four plus four, and you write nine, and your teacher puts an X, that's an error. And the very last word of that sentence is error. That's an error. It's really a shame to be in error and not realize it. Yes. And that's the first time I've ever heard you with a Southern accent. So I enjoyed that (laughs) with error. And so, yes, I agree. We need to speak the truth in love at all times. Verse 28, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, who are they? Humankind. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, not just doing evil, but inventing ways to do evil, disobedient to parents, the destruction of the family is how I see that, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, who? Mankind, they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. That the world from the very beginning understood that this rebellion against God brings forth death. They not only do the same, mankind not only does the same, but also give hearty approval to those that practice them. They're creating a society that says, this is good, this is how we're going to live our lives. We are not going to acknowledge God. We're not going to give thanks to God. We are going to go our own way, and we are rejecting God and His Word, and we're going to live our lives the way that we want to, even though we know that it produces death. And we're going to tell everybody else, 
Go do what you want to. There's not this thing called sin, and we give you hearty approval for your lifestyle and the way that you are living. That is completely against the gospel. I like Paul's sort of list here at the end. I don't think it's an exhaustive list, similar to where he I agree. He talks about the, the fruit of the Spirit. But, you know, you look at some of these, and you can just, you know, have some interesting parameters for what this looks like when they were given away. And what I thought, you know, we're living in this age of entertainment today, and especially in the, in the Western culture, Hollywood. But you take a list of those, and that's almost exactly what Hollywood is portraying in a lot of these movies, a lot of Every just movie, their, every show. Yeah, and even their own personal life. You talk about, you know, being untrustworthy and the amount of divorce and everything that comes out of this culture that's, that's trying to tell us a lot of times how we should live and what we should do. To me, that goes back to that foolish calling things wise, or you know, the wise calling things foolish. And not only are they doing that, but you have people that are with them and and cheering them on and saying, yeah, you're right, go, that's exactly what we should be doing. That's exactly what you should say. This isn't right. And you have this whole almost cheering section from people that that are not walking with the Lord, telling other people this is okay to do these things. Think about Hollywood. Who would ever listen to the people in Hollywood? What credibility do they have in anything within their lives? Yet people run to them, listen to them, follow them by the millions, and they think that these are philosophers and people that we should listen to concerning politics and how to live your life. You should be listening to just the opposite. Listen to God's Word, because when you read this list, it does speak about a society that refuses to acknowledge God, and in our media culture, where is the acknowledgement of God? If there's any acknowledgement of God, it's in a pantheistic understanding of God and not about the one true creator, the one great God, like Laura mentioned, the great I am. Anything can be God, and instead of worshiping the creator, the creation becomes the focus. So I agree, and I believe this defines sinful nature or that the product of sinful nature It defines mankind that walked away from God. We do have a choice. We do have a free will. God did release us. And now from the very beginning, we walked away from God and we are responsible for our own sin. And how dare a person generations away look back to God and say, if God was a God of love, why all of this destruction and death? That would be like a teenage son who is living in rebellion against a father and mother that love him, and finally they have to release him to his own destruction, to his own desires, and he goes out and destroys his life and has a family and destroys their life, and them looking back and saying, it's all your fault. This is what we do. This is what the non-believer does. This is what the agnostic, the atheist, the person that is trying to understand all the death and destruction in this world. Well, if God is a God of love, why is my family destroyed? Why is my society destroyed? Why are we having war? Remember, God never walked away from us. Mankind walked away from God. And sin becomes the foundation of preaching the gospel. And if we remove sin and the understanding that it's your sin that separates you from God, it will never bring the message of repentance to where it needs to be that points us to faith in Christ, which is the grace of God that has come once and for all. And so we need to get back to the basics of the gospel. In the seeker-friendly movement, I'm going to say it one more time, they've taken the foundation of Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, they've removed it, and they want to put it on the back end. Jesus did not do this. The apostles did not do this. Paul doesn't do this. Isaiah does not do this. He says, Israel, Judah, it is your sin that separates you from God. And he will not hear your prayers. The only prayer that God will listen to from a person that is living in sin is a prayer of repentance that comes back to put their faith in God. And that has never changed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for your word. I pray that your word went forth here in this recording. Let it it minister to people's lives. Let lives be changed. Forgive us, O God, For when sin 
uh, tries to take hold of our lives and puts us into bondage. Lord, let us be people of repentance. Let us be people that die to ourselves and take up our own cross and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We put our faith in him. And thank you, God, that we have life in his name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to learn more about IGM or have any questions about this podcast, feel free to reach out to us at info at integritygm.com and connect with us on Instagram at integrity underscore global and Facebook at Integrity Global Missions. If you like our podcast, please share it and leave a review. Thank you for listening. Have a blessed day.